I'm very happy today to be joined by David Wallace Wells. He's written this outstanding book, The Uninhabitable Earth, a story of the future. It's now in paperback. It's got plaudits galore. Uh, very happy to have you on, David. Thanks for having me. So in the book, you talk about how you're not an environmentalist. In my opinion, this is a, an outstanding piece of work that covers uh, climate change, climate systems breakdown. What does that mean when you say you aren't an environmentalist? Or has that changed? Are you now an environmentalist? I think I couldn't honestly say now that I'm not, but when I started working on the book, I was someone who had lived his whole life in cities and was not especially enamored of nature and had seen over the course of my lifetime at least um, an environmental movement um, that was committed, it seemed to me, almost to the principle of nature at the expense of human well-being. Um, and not, the trade-off wasn't always clear and there are parts of the environmental movement that I admired, but um, it felt animated out of, by concern for the natural world primarily. And I came to, at this subject much more as honestly a human chauvinist who felt terrified at what was possible for the human animal living on this planet under conditions of climate change. And if I had to make a trade-off where I traded the well-being of the world's natural ecosystems for the well-being of humans, I probably would take that trade. Now I know enough now to know that trade is impossible, that we're all stitched into the same fabric, we share the same fate, and if um, the world's ecosystems are collapsing, it will affect us too. But I think I come to the subject really from a, a quite different perspective than people who at least 10 or 20 years ago would have called themselves proudly environmentalists. Do you think that's um, a failure of the environmentalist movement or the green movement over the last 20 to 30 years, that people such as yourself, who may be progressives, who may have agreed, with many of their principles and objectives, didn't necessarily identify with them? Do you think that's a political failure of that movement over the last 20 to 30 years? I would say it's been a failure of the climate movement more than the environmental movement. Right. So by that I mean that you know there, there are always gonna be people who have those political commitments as the sort of extreme environmentalists do, and I admire them for that they should, if they li live their values, um, embody their values. Mm -hmm. um, but to the extent that there was an effort to engineer a sort of more mainstream um, climate um, mobilization in in politics in the UK and the US, I do think that there was um, some missed opportunities for reach out, um, that there were a lot of people who had concerns about the state of the natural world and what it would mean for humans living in it for that natural world to be degraded in, in dramatic ways. Um, but they didn't feel like there were voices uh, talking to them or um, politics that reflected their needs. Um, at the highest levels there was something much more like um, sort of blasé technocratic solutionism. Um, and I think as a result for a long time, a lot of people who might have otherwise been mobilized um, by the worsening conditions of the planet um, felt not as engaged as they might be. But I think the bigger problem there was um, the storytelling and the messaging outside of the political sphere. I think that for a generation or so, scientists were really reluctant to talk honestly about what they knew and saw coming for climate change. And I think climate journalists were the same way because they took their cues from those scientists. They felt it was irresponsible to be frank with the public. And I think, as a, as a journalist, I think that that was patronizing and problematic, but to the extent that I think of myself now also as a sort of quasi or part-time advocate, I also think it, it cost a lot of, it cost the environmental movement, the climate movement, um, a lot of support because many people who were like I was until a few years ago, aware of the problem, but not especially alarmed, um, could have been engaged and mobilized a decade or two ago, um, but in fact have really only become engaged and mobilized over the last year. And that's really important because as you detail in the book, most of the damage has really been committed in the last 35 years, 40 years. Uh, whereas obviously we think about climate change beginning industrial revolution, yeah. late, late 18th century, early 19th century. But that inertia, that inability to act, despite being in receipt of the facts, really since the end of the 1980s properly, yeah. that may be the thing that tips us over. And so that, that, that lack of a political response really may be one of the great historical mistakes of our species, might not it? Yeah, and if we had started decarbonizing seriously in, say, the year 2000, when Al Gore won the, the majority of votes in his election um, in the US, we'd have a much easier time doing it than um, doing it now. now the technology wasn't where it is today, and so in certain ways it'll be easier starting now than it would have been starting then. But politically, um, I think it would have been um, you know, much better for us to get going earlier. And these, these numbers, you know, you, you can, you can um, they're so astonishing, you, you almost can't believe them. You know, I, I was born in 1982, I've been alive 
for the clear majority of all of the carbon emissions that have ever been produced in the entire history of humanity. You know, Taylor Swift, who was born in 1989, has been alive for almost 40% of all the carbon emissions that have ever been produced in the entire history of humanity. This morning, I was speaking with James Lovelock, the environmentalist. He's 100 years old. He's been alive for about 90 or 95% of all of the carbon emissions that have ever been produced by, in the history of humanity. This one man's lifetime. His story includes the, you know, he arrives on a planet that is completely stable, where only in a few pockets of the world are we even burning fossil fuels, and he will die in a world that is literally on the brink of catastrophe, um, choking on carbon and unable to get off its addiction to carbon. That is just an astonishing amount of change in one person's lifetime. But as you say, the gradations of change are e extreme and horrifying even when you cut them, cut them smaller. You know, a quarter of all carbon emissions have happened since the iPhone was released. I mean, um, since An Inconvenient Truth and since Hurricane Katrina, more than a quarter. Um, these are, you know, we're doing so much damage every year that um, the climate is changing now practically in real time. We're seeing that with the, the extreme weather, um, the hurricanes. You know, as recently as a few years ago, you still had to talk about climate change in the future tense. Mm. The subtitle of my book here in England is a story of the future. It's no longer a story of the future. It's very much a story of the present because of how much damage we've done just over the last generation as people who are still currently in power were in power. And that I think is horrifying too. You know, I met last week Greta Thunberg who was talking, you know, talks quite pointedly about the um, fail failings of those in power. It's amazing to, like, to think just how many of those people are still in the positions that they were 25 years ago. Executives of the fossil fuel companies were working at those same companies 25 years ago. American politicians, many of our senators are in their 70s and 80s. Those people were already on Capitol Hill when this issue was being debated seriously and then discarded as something to do something about. Um, it's really you know, an indictment of those people, but it's also an indictment of us for not replacing them <laughs> and um, producing a new politics that could actually give us a chance of achieving, if not a totally stable, happy climate, than one that you and I would at least recognize as livable. Is there a counter argument, however, which says that climate systems breakdown is just simply too big for the human mind to fathom? You talked about a story about the future, but it's already here. And I remember a, a quote made by a friend of mine, and they said, it's not the future which is too complex for us to understand, it's the present. And that's very much how I sort of understand climate systems breakdown with the rise of extreme weather events, all the sort of tortured means by which it expresses itself in, in the present from drought, to declining crop yields, um, rising sea levels, political tensions, resource scarcity, etc. Is it a failure of certain people with certain material interests, who, as you've rightly mentioned, are still often in, in positions of power, or is it a, a broader cognitive issue? Uh, because, of course, if it's just the former, we just need to get rid of those people and get new people. But if it is a question of climate systems breakdown, climate change being simply too big for a human brain or even a society within a specific generational span to understand, that makes an, uh, an accompanying or appropriate politics quite hard to generate, doesn't it? Well, I think we are poorly suited to tackling this challenge. I think that we have cognitive biases that prevent us from seeing it clearly. I think that we have a sense of our own self-interest that um, sort of coaches us to move more slowly or to think more, you know, more through um, conceptions of our own self-interest and, and that sort of thing. I, I definitely think that there are problems at the individual level cognitively. But I also think ultimately, I don't think it's a hard a story to understand. You know, the planet is already hotter now than it's ever been in all of human history, which means that the climate conditions that have governed everything that we've ever known as a species, the evolution of humans, the development of culture, the development of agriculture, the development of modern civilization, all of that has taken place under climate conditions that no longer prevail. We're, already, we're heating the planet up considerably beyond that point going forward. And it will be an open question how much of the civilization that we've smuggled with us into this new world will be able to endure these new conditions. To me, that's actually relatively easy to understand. And I think you can see that logical, that narrative um, connection when people immediately at the, you know, the arrival of a hurricane or a wildfire are now pointing the finger at climate change. I think generally speaking, the informed public does understand the issue and its complexity. The problem is that we have a sense of our own narrow self-interest that coaches against dramatic action. 
We want essentially to live in the world as it is today rather than changing it because changing it seems so hard. Um, I think to me that is, the, that is the bigger challenge affecting individual action. I think we've gotten through the conceptual, um, past the conceptual threshold and have communicated the basic big picture science sufficiently so that those who have their eyes open now see climate change almost everywhere they look. So given all that, why do you not think there have been more popular expressions of climate change and this, this catastrophe which has already started? If you look at the highest grossing films of last year, Black Panther, The Incredibles, Avengers, if you look at the big sort of TV series of our generation, Game of Thrones, House of Cards, do you see a, a connection between this detour into fantasy? There's no other word for it. Despite the fact we have aging populations, mainstream culture has never been more infantile in many ways. And the scale of this calamity, do you think this is almost signifying that we don't want to talk about probably the most important seismic challenge humanity's ever confronted? I think our culture does reflect that disinterest. I think um, in general, we, are, we prefer escapism to confronting ugly reality, which is the situation we find ourselves in today. And we want that, especially when we're trying to relax and watch movies. But I also see in the growth of superhero movies, um, a kind of anxiety about the fate of the planet. I mean, these are stories that are essentially contemporary um, morality tales and fables. And I write, as I write in the book, one of the things that is happening as we enter into an age defined by climate change is that we are collectively entering into a kind of mythology. If it's only taken us, say, 30 years to bring the planet from a stable climate to the brink of catastrophe, and now we have only 30 more years to really avert some worst case scenarios, that means that my life, my lifetime, is going to contain this unbelievably epic story where we've brought the fate of the world into our own hands and now we have to decide what to do with it. This is mythology, it is theology to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that our narratives are turning more in that direction through comic books probably reflects some sense of the grand scale of the drama that we're all living through today, even if it's also the case that it reflects our total escapist mm -hmm. fantasies. And I think this is really important to keep in mind in the sense that generally with climate, very few things resolve each other, neat, re resolve themselves neatly. You know, it's not the case that either we're going to save ourselves from climate change or we'll be in a total disaster. Mm -hmm. It's not the case that we're going to produce eco-socialism or eco-fascism. Mm -hmm. Everything has many sides. And our cultural response to climate change is exactly the same way. There are many signs of, um, many signs that we just want to look away from the problem. But there are other signs that we're channeling those anxieties in subterranean ways, such that, you know, we have Mad Max, which is a story about an oil shortage, actually, but is essentially a portrait of a um, world devastated by climate change. We have First Reformed, which is a, um, an account of a crisis of conscience of a, of a priest about climate change. Um, and there are many stories like that that perform um, in some, like, it's kind of, uh, what's the word, um, orthogonal way to the, to the, um, the central saga of climate change. Um, some of them are quite grand and big. Um, some of them are quite small. But I think that we're evolving a culture that responds to this story for the first time because we're seeing now for the first time that this isn't a political imperative. It's not a political cause. It doesn't sit alongside the rest of our life in a way that we turn to it like we might turn to another political cause but we're starting to see it as the theater in which all of our lives are conducted. And I know this a little bit from talking to people in Hollywood, there are now a lot more movies that are being put into production, a lot more TV shows that are um, addressed to the climate crisis. They're not the day after tomorrow stories that are sort of neat little parables about climate change. What they are is an effort to tell all of the stories that we've already told in the context of climate change, because that is how, all of the, that, that is how we're living all of those stories ourselves. So there'll be romantic comedies about climate change and there'll be horror movies about climate change and there'll be stories that, po political stories that aren't about climate change per se, but unfold in a world defined by climate change. Um, I think that's the cultural future that we're heading into relatively quickly. And, you know, it's frankly, as a sort of journalist and sociological observer, it'll be fascinating to watch it unfold. So talking about the day after tomorrow, for me, that's kind of like the, the paradigmatic example of a, a disaster movie has catharsis, uh, and like I say, everything's kind of fine. Um, do you think that speaks to how we view revolution, social transformation as this kind of messianic moment? If we look at the Paris Commune or the, you know, the French Revolution or 1917 in Russia, we look at taking on Nazism, it was very much a defining moment. Um, but what you're saying is, it seems to me, is that we need to have kind of almost new cultural archetypes to understand what 
revolution or social transformation might look like, or collapse even. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, in general, history um, simplifies. Distance from events makes us have a quite rudimentary understanding of how they were. I don't think that the people participating in any of those events that you mentioned probably thought that they were simplistic revolutionary takeovers either. They were quite messy. Probably a lot of people felt disappointed and left out and frustrated. Um, and then, then, of course, a lot of people suffered in a lot of those um, events as well and were angry um, at what transpired on, on that basis. I think climate change is, is sort of the same. Um, political change of any kind, but especially change of this scale, requires concerted, dramatic, probably even global movements moving in the right, you know, pushing in the right direction, pushing hard in the right direction. Now, almost certainly not everybody's going to get what they want. Almost certainly we're not going to be able to avert really really bad climate suffering, like that is almost inevitable. Um, but if we hope to avoid the worst case outcomes, it requires a real commitment to a new climate politics, one that focuses our attention on this as the absolute priority of everything we do, because truly it does govern almost anything you could possibly care about in the political sphere. If you care about poverty, if you care about income inequality, if you care about violence and conflict, if you care about conflict, you know, violence against women, if you care about um, famine and drought, um, if you care about political instability and social disarray, um, if, you care about, if you care about crime, all of these things have a climate fingerprint now. And 30 years from now, 40 years from now, if we've done nothing to address climate, each of those challenges is going to be much, much harder to address than it would be if we had solved the climate part, solved is too generous a word, if we had addressed the climate um, problem now and, and sort of softened um, each of those impacts along the way. You know, there's a study came out a few months ago showing that the countries of the developing world had already lost 25% of their global of their um, GD, potential GDP over the last four decades because of climate change. They're a quarter poorer than they would be without climate change already today. And climate change had already exacerbated global income inequality as a result quite dramatically. Now casting that forward, there are economic studies that show by the end of the century, there are whole parts of the world, the equatorial brand, even much of the tropics, where countries would not have any hope of economic growth at all going forward. So we would have literally eliminated the possibility of um, a future that is better than the present for everyone living in India and everyone that's living in Bangladesh and everyone that's living in Saudi Arabia and Iran. That is possible within the lifetime of my daughter today. I hope it doesn't happen. But if we want to create a world that is prosperous and fulfilling and just and offers opportunities to all, we need to take action now to secure some of that possibility for the generations to come. Is there a solution to climate change within capitalism? Is green growth the answer? I don't know, but I'm not as sure that it isn't as some others on the, in the environmental movement are. Um, I think a lot depends on how we design that growth and, um, and how we shape capitalism. I think absolutely for sure the system as it exists today needs dramatic reform at the very least to address this crisis. Um, probably something more like systematic renovation. But if I imagine... Such, such as what? Well, um, for instance, the IMF, which is no lefty organization, estimates that we're t today subsidizing the fossil fuel business globally to the tune of $5.3 trillion a year. Now, that's a slightly misleading figure because they don't just count direct subsidies. They also count the fact that um, our carbon price today doesn't reflect environmental externalities. But if you take that number seriously, $5.3 trillion, we could theoretically redirect those subsidies to renewable energy and investment in R&D in carbon capture technology and trans new transportation infrastructure, et cetera, and essentially solve the problem immediately. I mean, that is an investment of a scale globally that could achieve that kind of transformation. And that wouldn't even mean perturbing any part of the system except the payout that we give fossil fuel companies today. I mean, it's a lot. I mean, that's what, maybe 8% of global GDP. It's huge. That's a lot, yeah. yeah. Um, which is why I don't think it's likely to happen anytime soon. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, generally speaking, I don't think that a carbon tax is a sufficient um, nudge on this, on, on this point. I think it won't make nearly as big a difference nearly as quickly as we need. But I think it can make a difference. It can change some markets and um, produce some innovation. And I do think if you look at the rapid growth of renewables over the last decade or so, um, especially in countries like um, the US and the UK, but really actually all around the world, um, those are, that is growth that was uh, made possible by um, public investments, but then carried forward by private innovation and, um, and market forces, and which um, in the right regulatory environment would be poised to take over the whole global energy system. At the moment, we still have many countries in the world who are kind of captive to the interests of oil and gas and who are, um, whose regulations reflect that, um, 
that capture, that policy capture. But if we didn't, I think that um, because of the market power of renewables today, we could imagine a totally remade energy system in relatively short order. But that is still just 35% of the global problem. We often think, especially in places like the US and the UK, that electricity is the whole issue and replacing you know, coal and, and oil with, um, with wind and solar will solve the problem. It's barely a third of the solution to the problem. We also have to completely reimagine how we do infrastructure. You know, if cement were a country, it would be the world's third biggest emitter. And China is now pouring more cement every three years than the U.S. poured in the entire 20th century. Um, we need to reimagine the way that we um, do transportation infrastructure. We need different kinds of planes because every seat on a plane that flies from New York to London melts three square meters of Arctic ice. Um, we need to reimagine the way that we grow food, um, eat, um, and you know run our industrial operations and factories. All of those sectors need to be completely remade. And when I say completely remade, it's really important to keep in mind, we don't just need to reduce our carbon emissions, we need to eliminate them entirely. Because if we're, say at three degrees even, at the end, towards the end of the century, and we're still producing even a fraction of the carbon that we're producing today, we'll still be heating the planet further. Any additional carbon that we put into the atmosphere is going to continue to heat the planet. That means that if we want to stabilize it at any temperature, even a totally hellish four degrees, five degrees of warming, we're going to need to completely zero out on our carbon emissions entirely. And that is a scale of transformation that makes me think that a solution within capitalism may be a little harder to pull off because it really means replacing at the root nearly every aspect of modern life because every aspect of modern life has a carbon footprint which we cannot afford to continue walking in. Here's the thing. I mean, I agree with that conclusion, and I agree there probably is a place for the price mechanism and, and, and for market diffusion. I mean, that's why I find the Green New Deal so alluring, because it, it's quite obvious, actually, if you look at the graphs, you look at the data, that by the end of the 21st century, global energy demand could be met by renewables to a significant extent, if not entirely. But the point oh, is By the end of the century, I would say entirely. Entirely, yeah. right? And that's, I know. I mean, I'd agree with that. But the point is, they're not going to diffuse anywhere near quickly enough, because there's a minimal role of the state. We fetishize private investment, um, we fetishize really not adjusting in incentives because of market equilibrium and so on. So I agree with you on all of that, but it sounds to me like you're talking about such a, a systems change that it would clearly be at odds with specific economic interests to such an extent that you couldn't really call it capitalism. I mean, we can call it capitalism, people are still investing money to make money, fine, but it would look so fundamentally different to what we presently have on a global scale that to me does sound revolutionary. And I don't use the term lightly. Yeah, I think that that's a fair assessment. Um, I think it's worth keeping in mind that the UN's main analogy for what we need to do is World War II. They say that we need to mobilize against climate globally at the scale that we mobilized against the Axis forces in World War II. Now, it's an open question. Is what happened during World War II um, socialism, capitalism? Um, it's a complicated mix of um, different systems right. at once, I would say. Right. Um, there were still, you know, markets were still operating and trade was still ongoing, but there was a dramatic takeover of industry by um, most of these nations involved in the war, a total redirecting of the priority of their countries. Yeah. Um, you know, in the US we had, you know, uh, the UK too, um, a draft and also most, a draft of all fighting age men and all women of that age were drafted into the workforce. So we saw a total transformation of the entire culture of these countries within just a year or two. Um, that's what the UN says is necessary to avert catastrophic warming. Now we know that's not happening now, but um, you know, it's also important to keep in mind that climate change, again, it's not a binary thing. It's not about avoiding that two degree threshold or else we give up. Mm -hmm. If we're able to keep it to two degrees as opposed to 2.5 degrees or 2.5 degrees as opposed to three degrees, that's a huge success. Mm -hmm. And people often ask me if I'm optimistic about this story, and ultimately I think it's a matter of perspective. When you and I walk around outside, um, we're acquainted with the climate of the present day. And I think intuitively, emotionally, we anchor our expectations for the future based on what our experience of the climate in the present is, which is really not rational because we know that the climate is inevitably gonna change somewhat and probably somewhat dramatically. So I prefer to base my expectations on the path we're on now, where we're headed, what we're doing now. And if the UN says that we're on track for about four degrees or actually even north of four degrees of warming this century based on where, what we're doing now, I think we can avert some dramatic share of that, maybe one and a half degrees, maybe two degrees, get us all the way down to two degrees of warming um, through action that I see as possible 
through policies like the Green New Deal um, and other sort of targeted regulatory and investment programs um, taken up by it would have to be all of the countries of the world. Um, but I do think that some, um, some progress like that is possible within something like our existing system. Mm -hmm. Now again, we may look back on reforms that we put, put in place 50 years from now and think, well, that really was a transformation. We used to do things one way, and now we're doing things another way. But I think that, um, it's un that cha change of that scale, personally, is unlikely to be brought about by what we, in our history classes, learn about as revolution. And, um, is something likely to, likelier to be something that's slower, um, more complicated, and unfolding in the world as we recognize it today, rather than involving a total transformation of the political systems that we live in. But I could be wrong. Yeah, I think the analogy of the Second World War is a really compelling one, actually. Because um, if you look at the UK, the US, obviously the UK is deindustrializing nowhere near as much as the United States, it's difficult for us to imagine that 70, 80 years ago, full mobilization of industry to create tens of thousands of tanks, planes, etc. And I often talk about the role of the state in, in, in dealing with these kinds of challenges, whether it's demographic age and climate change. And I say, look, 1939, war breaks out. You, you didn't have the British ruling class say, let's leave it to the market as how many Spitfires we're going to start manufacturing. Yeah, supermarines still make the Spitfires, but there are, there are state-led targets, there's state-led investment. They say you have to produce this many units within this particular period of time. And for me, that is clearly such a massive break with where we are presently with the you know, the utter primacy of, of shareholder value, privatisation, outsourcing. But I agree with you, it's not a revolution perhaps as, you know, traditionally understood, but I think it's such a break with the past that I think it's going to meet with political resistance, which brings us to the Green New Deal. What, what, what should be the primary sort of political mobilising frames for the Green New Deal? Because often it, it, it seems to me that what it's trying to do is make very radical demands without really upsetting anybody. And the truth is that certain interests lose out if we adopt the Green New Deal, otherwise it already would have happened. So, I mean, is that a fair assessment? Do you think it could go further, or do you think the messaging of it is just right? I think the messaging genius of the, of the Green New Deal is to attach climate transformation to social justice programs that are extremely popular, but have no political platform in the US at the moment. So people really like the idea of a jobs guarantee, and they really like the idea of uh, universal health care. Um, they're not universally popular programs, but they're, they command um, you know, commanding majorities of public support. And in fact, those initiatives are much more well-liked than the direct climate ones that are um, rolled up in the Green New Deal. I think there is some real genius positioning there. Um, I think that, yeah, of course, some people will, some, there, there will be some institutions and some, um, some sectors of the economy that suffer. But I think it's important to keep in mind that at the moment, um, the government's hands are already on the levers of power here. Um, we're already subsidizing the fossil fuel business in significant ways. We're already overseeing you know, the electrical grid operating as poorly as it's operating. Um, we're already regulating um, agriculture and what farmers can and can't do. Um, the question is, are we imposing those regulations and conducting that oversight and making those investments in ways that actually pay off or only sort of short-term payoffs um, for particular interest groups. And I think you're, you're right to suggest that they're really the second, but that also suggests its own solution, which is to say, um, if you can really make them investments that um, pay us back quite quickly, then they will be extremely popular investments in the relatively short term. And I think on that point, um, it's been really encouraging to see just over the last couple of years, really a whole new economic conventional wisdom emerge around climate change. As recently as five years ago, um, most economists would have said, climate change could be scary, um, but the impacts actually don't add up. They don't cost all that much when we look at the, the bottom line. And the cost of taking action to prevent it is actually quite high. Mm -hmm. And so you have to say, do we lose, spend all this money, lose all this economic growth in order to prevent outcomes which may seem to us um, humanitarian crises, but are not hugely impactful economically. And being economists, they said basically we shouldn't. Um, I think for a generation or so that really shaped our public policy, but it's a perspective that has really changed over the last few years, such that now almost every economist will tell you that faster action will, be, um, will pay off quickly for us and leave us in a much better position economically in relatively short order. There's a major report in 2018 saying the global economy could add $26 trillion by just 2030 through rapid decarbonization. And I've been particularly encouraged by a proposal that the government of Indonesia put forward 
This is a country, it's a developing country, like a lot of developing countries, um, they've grown enormously over the last couple of decades. They've doubled their income and halved their poverty rate just in the last two decades, but they've done so, like a lot of other developing countries, by industrializing, which means they've also doubled their carbon emissions. But they say at this point, looking forward, they can have those emissions by 2030, which would put them ahead of their commitments under the Paris Accords, which no major industrial nation in the world is on track to meet, and still grow at 6% per year, which is in fact faster than the 5% per year that they've grown over the last two decades. And that reflects, I think, this new growing economic sense that there, is a, there are huge opportunities here. First of all, the cost of inaction is higher than we thought, but also there are huge opportunities here um, for climate action. And I think that's one reason why we've seen such, um, such more ambitious targets and pledges made by the government of Denmark and Finland and the UK um, over the last year or so. I think the protest movements we've seen is, are, have also been a big part of that. But I think that the fact that policymakers can say, actually, this isn't going to be all that costly, it could be quite beneficial to us, is another factor pushing more action rather than slower action. And for that, I'm grateful. So there's a, a break there with sort of conventional market wisdom in terms of what you're championing, but you think a, a significant number of people could get on board with that. I guess looking at the green movement historically, going back to the sort of opening questions, do you think that the sort of deep green movement could be something of a, um, a weight in terms of this stuff? So often if I talk to sort of deep green activists or advocates, they'll say, oh, there's no such thing as green growth. There's no possible way of decoupling GDP growth from carbon emissions. That's obviously not something you're saying. Do you just think they're, they're wrong or could they be right? And, you know, and, and does that ne therefore mean that the entire sort of political economic project you're talking about doesn't really have a doesn't really have a viable future. Well, I think that they're right to, you know, to point out that the entire history of economic growth is coincident with our use of fossil fuels and has been tied up in that in a totally, you know, where those are, things are in bed together the whole time. We probably would not have the history of economic growth that we've had without fossil fuels. Um, the question of whether we can you know, develop a new system that continues to deliver growth without relying on fossil fuels, I think it's an open question. I think it's fair to raise the question. When I look at the progress of renewable energy in particular, I see a lot of hope there. I see that um, you know, we've been able to expand our capacity quite dramatically and prices have fallen astonishingly over the last decade. Um, and you know, again, if- but They would call you a technological sort of optimist or utopian, wouldn't they? That would be, that, that would be their sort of response. I do, have, I do have faith in technological innovation. I don't have faith that we have enough time to see that come about without also a lot of government oversight and regulation. I think it has to be sort of all solutions at once. Um, that's the scale of the problem that we're dealing with right now. But I also think that um, the deep green movement, as you're calling them, um, have a different set of concerns um, than I do. When I read about you know, the environmental devastation that's required to produce solar panels, I wish that that weren't the case. But to me, that isn't a reason to not continue producing solar panels. Um, when I read about the, you know, the amount of rare earth mining that has to be done to produce um, new battery capacity. Mm. Again, I wish that we didn't have to do that, mm. um, but I'll take that deal if it stops the planet from warming an additional degree or two degrees, um, because I think the impacts of that level of warming so outweigh the environmental concerns um, of that kind mm. that it's worth taking. And just to you know, use a, an example to illustrate the point, um, the UN is expected to release a report in about six weeks about the state of the oceans. They recently did a major report on land. This report on oceans has just leaked, and they say that even if we keep the planet to two degrees of warming, um, the damage from storms and sea level rise will grow a hundredfold. We will be dealing with a hundred times more damage from storms and sea level rise as we're dealing with today, even if we hold the planet to two degrees of warming, which I think practically is about a best case scenario. Mm. They say even if we keep things to two degrees, 280 million people will be displaced from their homes. When I think about impacts of that scale, I think, okay, I'd rather not be opening up huge mines where we're dealing with all this stuff and releasing some toxic fumes. I would rather not do that, but I will do that if it means avoiding a future that's not just at two degrees, but three degrees or four degrees. I do personally believe it's worth that trade-off. And I think a lot of people in the, in the, um, you know, in the extreme environmental movement as you're describing, um, are uncomfortable with some of those trade-offs. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, here in Britain, there's a new coal power station which is being created to produce steel. And right now, the only really viable way of producing steel at mass scale is by using, is by using coal. That may change in the next 10 to 15 years, but that's where we are right now. 
And immediately, because a Labour councillor council signed that off, Green Party activists, even including their, their leader, Caroline Lucas, said, look, this really undermines their green credentials. And I'm thinking, if we're going to have a Green New Deal, we're going to create, you know, you know, have a rapid rollout of high-speed rail, you know, getting more people to use buses, etc., retrofitting homes. Clearly, we're going to be using more stuff just generally. But I, I, I viewed that sort of, that critique as quite limited, quite weak, and ultimately, I think it's, it's going to fail. Because like you say, the alternative is this other thing, which is hundreds of millions of people being displaced, potentially dying. Which is my final question, I guess. That view, which I think is a really compelling one, I agree with it, it seems to me that's at odds with the kind of view you get from Naomi Klein, where she talks about extractivism. And extractivism and capitalism are the same thing, as if mining anything, as if taking any kinds of resources from the planet was a necessarily bad thing. And I think what you really capture in this edition, actually, because it's talked about at the end, and of course it's a paperback version, you talk about it really succinctly, about how this is really an anti-humanist politics. Is that a fair assessment, that this kind of idea of extractivism and that mining is necessarily bad. Do you think that necessarily privileges nature, capital N, above, above human happiness and human flourishing? Well, I think that there's a lot of extraction of human capital going on too in a, in a kind of punishing way in the, in the current system. Um, so I wouldn't say that, you know, I wouldn't say that opposing the system on that basis is anti-humanist. Um, but I do think that we're in a crisis point for the fate of the species on this planet. And I think that requires us to really prioritize and emphasize um, ourselves um, to make sure that we can secure a kind of livable, relatively prosperous, relatively rewarding future for ourselves. And, you know, as I say, if, it, if that happens to mean a little bit of environmental degradation here and there, I wish it weren't the case, but I'll take it. Um, frankly, if I think that our only hope is going to a degrowth model where we've abandoned the principle of growth um, and consumer, um, you know, consumer well-being and all of the material comforts that people like you and I enjoy unjustly because other people in the world are suffering as a result. But if we're go if we're trying, if we think the only model, um, the only paradigm, the only solution to this problem is abandoning all that, when I look at the world, I see a very slim chance of us abandoning all that um, in the time that we need. Uh, that we have to change our, our system. And that makes me um, not object to that perspective at an intellectual level or even a political level. On both of those levels, I have sympathy for that reading, but almost just on a practical level. And in that sense, I may be, I may be wrong. I may be, I may be foolish or I may be naive. Um, there may be much more of an appetite to abandon the system that we live in today than I think. But um, my own read is that there are many more people who are discontent on the margins who want some changes, but who don't want a total overhaul of their entire worldview and expectations for the future. I don't think there are many people who want to live in a world where they can no longer expect that their children will live more prosperous lives than their own. I think that there are many, many more people who want to continue to believe in that future. And I think that requires some amount of accommodation to um, a growth economy and possibly even an extractive economy if it comes to that. I think if we if we want to throw that out the window, we're going to add, we're going to be asking the world to swallow a lot that they are not going to be happy swallowing.